الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله وبالله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله آل الله أما بعد Dear viewers, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you back to this seventh episode on Rasalatul Hukuq in which we have been discussing the rights of human beings and the rights of the Creator and the rights of the nafs. We have so far been using the Rasalatul Hukuq of Imam al-Sajjal sallallahu alayhi to discuss primarily the meaning of the concept of rights in Islam. Then we move to discuss the concept of Allah, or the concept of rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest right of Allah and what it entails. Then we move to discuss the concept of soul and the rights of the soul, from which we moved to discuss the rights of the tongue, and then the sight, and then the hearing, and then the hands, and then the feet or the legs. Today we would like to discuss two rights of the faculties or in our example of the computer we would say of the applications. The everything we put in to this computer which is the body affects the output but everything has to go through the applications. Everything has to go through those applications which uh, is run in the body. And Imam Sajjad, although there are many applications, the Imam Sajjad is mainly focusing on two. The stomach, which is the our faculty of hunger, and the uh, private parts of the body, which is the faculty of lust and desires. These two faculties have a great importance in how we uh, take out, make our decisions and how far or close we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says that I fear thalathun akhafuhunna ala ummati. I fear three things for my ummah after myself. Al-dalalatu ba'd al-ma'rifati wal-madallatu al-fitani Three things I fear for my ummah after me. It is misguidance after knowledge, misleading temptations, and the lust of the stomach and the private parts. And Imam Baqir he says, There is no ibadah done of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is greater than the purity than the purity of the uh, button of the stomach and the farj, the private parts. So we see the importance given in Islam to these both um, concepts, to the bo these both faculties, the faculty of hunger and the faculty of desire. Uh, now these faculties are important for our survival. If we do not eat, we will not survive. If we do not eat, we will not be able to live for very long. And if we don't reproduce, then there will be no more human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have given us these for a certain purpose, but they need to be controlled and used for that which is correct. Now we will discuss why there, some people uh, look down upon the religious views on these things, but inshallah we'll come to that, especially that of desires. As for the Rasalat al Imam Sajjad says, وَأَمَّا حَقُّ بطنك, As for the rights of your stomach, it is that you do not make it a vessel, a container for neither little of haram nor much of it. And that you intend for it only that which is halal. Your determination should be that I will only eat that which is halal. وَلَا تُخْرِجَهُ مِنْ حَدِّ التَّقْوِيَّةِ إِلَىٰ حَدِّ التَّهْوِينِ وَذَهَابِ الْمُرُوَّةِ And that you do not um, exceed the bounds of strengthening to the extent of belittling your stomach. If you don't respect the boundaries of Allah, you will belittle your stomach to the point that you lose your muruwah. We will come back to this. وَضَبْتُهُ إِذَا هَمَّ الْجُوعِ وَالذَّمْعَةِ And that you should restrain it whenever you are extremely hungry and thirsty. Why? For a shab'a, being full, having the sense of being full, it will cause the person, if you overeat yourself, 
and if you overindulge yourself, it will lead the person who has overeaten and over drunk, it will lead him to uh, being sluggish, indolence, uh, proud, proudful, indigest, indigestion, and it will also drive away nobility and good deeds, and it will drive away your muruwa. Muruwa is a word that many people might not hear a lot, but in the pre-Islamic Arabia, the concept of muruwa was very important, and Islam kept this word and kept it as an important quality. Muruwa, the best translation would be chivalry, although it doesn't cover it all. But imagine if all the good akhlaqi attributes, generosity, kindness, uh, being friendly to guests and taking care of your guests, all these things, uh, respect for the uh, other gender, if all these things could be collected into one, if all these things could be collected into one attribute, that would be muruwa, chivalry. Imam Sajjad says, if you overeat and you overdrink, the first thing that will go away is muruwa. And that would be a great loss. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Salatatun yuhibbu Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves three things. Qillatul kalami wa qillatul manami wa qillatul ta'am. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when people speak less and when people sleep less and when people eat less. You should do this to the point of necessity, but do it only to the point of necessity. And Allah hates their opposites. And Imam Ali sallallahu says that idmanu shabai yurithu anwa al waji that if you fill your stomach every time you eat you fill your stomach you fill your stomach to the limit to the point where you can actually feel the food appear sometimes that happens people eat and eat and eat and they don't stop eating now there is a um, problem in the communication, so to say, that the brain is not informed that the stomach is full. It takes about 20 minutes from the time that the stomach is actually full to the brain realizes that that's it, we've had enough. And so people all keep on overeating themselves. Imam Ali says that if you do this, you will inherit loads of diseases. We live in a time when we are being bombarded, eat your five five a days of vegetables and fruits, eat your uh, vitamins, make sure you don't eat this, make sure you eat that, make sure you eat in moderation, don't eat fat, don't eat this, don't eat... Imam Ali and the Prophet and Islam has taught it from the very beginning that we need to take care of these things, how much we eat and how we eat. Indeed, Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi once addresses his son and he says, Ya Bunaya, my son, oh my son, to Imam Hassan, should I not teach you four, four things? That if you follow these, if you acquire these, then you will never need a doctor. You will never need medication. You will never need a medical treatment. Now, of course, this doesn't discount all medical treatments, but in relation of these fields, if you follow these four advices, you will not need a medicine. So the Imam says, of course, Imam Hassan says, yes. So the Imam then, Imam Ali answers, لا تجلس على, على الطعام إلا وأنت جائع. Do not sit down to eat except when you are hungry. Just because that food looks nice, just because the kebab looks nice, just because the dessert looks nice, just because that looks nice, don't, the chicken tikka, whatever it is, just because it looks nice, don't rush towards it. Don't sit down to eat because or for the sake of eating. The food looks nice, but you can always eat when you get hungry. Don't sit to eat until you are hungry. That's the first advice. وَلَا تَقُمْ أَنِ الطَّعَامِ إِلَّا وَأَنْتَ وَتَسْتَحِيهِ And do not get up from the table except that you still are a bit hungry. Make sure that you eat and you still feel a bit hungry when you get up from the table. Do not fill your stomach. madga, And make sure that you uh, chew, the chew the food in a complete manner. Chew it properly. 
This is what the nutritionist of the day will also tell us, that make sure you chew your food properly, otherwise your stomach will not be able to digest it, or it will not digest it in the proper way. وَإِذَا نِمْتَ فَأَرَضْ نَفْسَكَ عَلَى الْخِلَاءِ And when you are going to bed, when you want to sleep, make sure that you go and empty your stomach and everything else. Make sure you go to the washroom or the toilet, basically. When you do this, and you take these actions, then you will not need any medical treatment. This is the advice of Amir al Mu'minin when it comes to the stomach and how to treat it. <clears throat> now, Imam Sajjad therefore told us that we need to respect these things and we need to respect the stomach and the needs of the stomach. We need to make sure that we eat, but only, to those, only eat those things which are good for us. Eating is an integral part of the human being. We can never ever escape eating. We have to eat. Indeed, there were some people who were expecting the Prophet not to eat. They were coming to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And they would say that what kind of Prophet is this? That he eats and he drinks. They were expecting the Prophets to be superhuman beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses them in the Quran. For example, he says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ Referring to the Prophets. وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ We did not make them bodies that don't eat. وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ And nor did they live on the earth forever. Their bodies had to go through death. وَقَالُوا مَا And Allah says, the, uh, quotes the people saying, وَقَالُوا مَا لِهَا, مَا لِهَا الرَّسُولِ What is the problem with this messenger? يأكل الطعام ويمشي في الأسواق that he walks in the streets and he eats he eats food Allah سبحانه وتعالى says this is how it is if there had been angels on earth Allah would have said angels so we are not saying here that we should not eat and not indulge in our lusts there is a certain level and certain limit to which we need to do it but there has to be this balance on how much that which is halal from that which is Haram. And of course, both eating and drinking we need to take care of in what level we are doing. Now, one of those things when it comes to eating, of course, we know already we are not supposed to eat certain types of meat, we are not supposed to eat certain types of food which are, which are haram for us, and alhamdulillah, we mostly we stay away from it. If we don't stay away from it, you see, on the plains of Karbala, Imam Hussein is talking to the enemies and he is speaking with them that have you not recognized who I am? Don't you recognize that I am the grandson of Rasulullah, I am the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib, I'm the son of Fatima, Hamza is my uncle, Ja'far is my uncle, all these people, Hassan is my uncle, don't you know who I am? And the people are just not understanding, they're just not listening. And at that point Imam Hussein makes a profound statement. He says, why don't you realize what I am saying? You have now filled your stomachs with haram. Because you have filled your stomachs with haram, you are not able to understand what I am saying. The hadith says that a person who eats a morsel of haram flesh, a morsel of haram meat, his prayers will not be accepted for 40 days. For 40 days his prayers will not be accepted. On the other hand, a person who makes sure that he eats only halal for 40 days, he's careful with this and he's only halal for 40 days, he will, uh, see, uh, he, he will feel enlightened. Of course, not in the sense that he will start seeing visions, this is not what he's trying to say, but avoiding haram and only eating halal will get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should not misunderstand this in any other way. Insha'Allah. Of course, so the, the hadith says that we should avoid certain things and we should eat that which is halal. Um, there is a very nice hadith from Imam Hassan sallallahu alayhi where he says, عَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ يَتَفَكَّرُ فِي مَأْكُولِ Now this is a word play so to say, where he says that I am bewildered at the one who is very careful at what he eats. كَيْفَ لا يتفكر في ما أقول. How is it that he doesn't think about what he is actually uh, putting to his mind? He thinks about what he eats في ما أقول. But he doesn't think about في ما أقول. He doesn't think about that which is given to his brain. 
فَيُجَنِّبُ بَطْنَهُ مَا يُؤْذِيهِ وَيُؤْدِعَ صَدْرَهُ مَا يُرْدِيهِ He keeps away from his stomach that which will harm, uh, hurt it, but he doesn't keep away from his brain, from his intelligent, intelligence, he doesn't keep away from that that which will cause his uh, corruption, or that which will harm it. So we need to take care of this, we need to make sure that we eat and that we eat in moderation. We need to make sure that we avoid that which is haram and specifically, and I say this to my young brothers and sisters specifically, seeing the challenges of the West, seeing the challenges living in this part of the world, the, that great danger. And I remember in my days when I used to be young, inshallah I'm young still, but in those days when I used to be young and we, we used to have friends, one of those things which all our friends, oh, we still have friends, but in the sense that our, some of the friends that would engage in those things which are not halal, they would never speak about doing that, which, uh, about indulging in drinking alcohol. Yet today we see that when we speak to the younger generation, they are not even ashamed about talking about alcohol. Alcohol is seen as something not necessarily evil. Alcohol is seen as something which is a, a part of life. Wherever we turn, wherever we go, alcohol is surrounding us and we need to make sure one of the rights of the stomach is that we keep this danger away from us. How merciful is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he forbade alcohol in such stern words in the Quran that a Muslim in his right sense will never go close to it. He will stay away from it. And the hadith says that the one who buys it, the one who sells it, the one who produces it, the one who carries it, the one who drinks it, and many other categories around alcohol, all of them are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should be very careful of staying away from alcohol. Beyond that, we should eat and drink that which is halal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُصْرِفُوا Eat, drink, and don't go to excess. Keep things in their limits. The second thing we wanted to talk about before our time for today is finished is the rights of the private part. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us Muslims that the private parts has certain rights and that we need to make sure that we are chaste and keep uh, our private parts chaste. Imam Sajjad explaining this says, as for the rights of your private part, it is It is that you keep it safe, it is that you keep it protected from that which is not halal for it. And that you help it by lowering the gaze. We've already spoken about lowering the gaze, but that you help it by it. It is the greatest of the help. If you want to help your private parts, the greatest help is that you lower your gaze. وَكَثْرَةُ ذِكْرِ الْمَوْتِ And that you remember mot a lot, that you remember death a lot. Because by remembering death, you are making sure that you remember that ultimate day when you will stand responsible. وَتَحَدُّدِ لِنَفْسِكَ بِاللَّهِ وَتَخْوِيفِ لَهَا بِهِ And that you threaten yourself by, with God, that you, threaten, you make threats to yourself, that remember Allah's punishment and that you make yourself fear Allah and that you maintain your decency and receive Allah's help in doing so. Now, our sexual desires is a part of the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has given to us and we need to make sure that we use them in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the societies sometimes that we live in the West, we live in societies where the prevailing religion or ideologies for many, many centuries had a very negative view on sex and sexuality. And therefore, the natural desires and inclinations of man and human beings, men and women, were suppressed and oppressed. Whereas Islam has a very balanced view. Now, when we look at the West, we find that it has gone from this suppressed and oppressed view on sexuality to go to the total op opposite, where everything has been made available. Everything has been made free. You do whatever you do you want. Everything goes. Islam teaches us the balance between these. Islam teaches us that we should be careful in how we uh, apply our sexuality. It is a necessity and it is something good. It uh, unites man and woman in, in, in marriage 
it should be applied in marriage. However, outside marriage, it is haram, and outside the boundaries of Allah, it is haram and should not be done outside the boundaries of Allah. The hadith by Imam Ja'far al Sadiq sallallahu wa sallam says, Fazin al Aynain. As for the eyes, they have a zina. Zina means those immoral, indecent acts between uh, two human beings. He says, the zina of the eyes is the view which is haram, is the sight, is the look which is haram. To look at a woman or a man which is haram for you to look at, this is the zina of the eyes. وَزِنَ الْفَمِ الْقُبْلَةِ And the zina of the mouth is the kiss. وَزِنَ الْيَدَيْنِ الْلَمْسُ And the zina of the hand is the touching. Shaking of the hand. صَدَّقَ الْفَرْجُ ذَلِكَ أَمْ كَذَّبْ Whether the private parts confirms it or not, i.e. whether the pri- you enjoyed it or not, it is a type of zina and we need to make sure that we un- avoid it. And Rasulullah is one, it is said that Rasulullah is uh, in the hadith says that he does la'na upon the one who looks at the uh, farj, uh, on the private parts of a woman that he is not allowed to look at. And so we need to make sure, we need to be careful with these things. Not only the actual acting, but the looking is haram. On the other hand, Islam then does not just throw us out like that, but Islam encourages the protection, not just in beautiful words, but Islam encourages the protection of this by marriage. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ About the mu'minun, he said, قَلْ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ He says, the mu'minun are successful. Who are the mu'minun? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِذُونَ Those who protect their private parts. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Except for their wives. When they are with their wives, they are, it is okay. And he says, فَمَنِ ابْتَغَى وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْعَادُونَ And those who want to go beyond this, those who transgress this, then those are the uh, transgressors, those are the enemies. So we need to make sure that we get married in good time and we need to assist in this, I will say to the community, all our communities that we need to make sure that we encourage and assist our young ones to get married in a suitable age. Rasulullah has said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, O people, O young people, or uh, gathering of young people. Man istata'a minkum ba. The one who has reached an age where you can marry, make sure you marry. And the one who cannot marry, then you should fast and this will strengthen you. This will allow you to keep safe from sinning. But make sure you don't allow yourselves to sin and avoid that sin. This concept of marriage is one of the most important concepts in marriage in Islam. And the hadith says, مَا بُنِيَ فِي الْإِسْلَامِ بِنَاءٌ حَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَعَزُّ مِنَ التَّزْوِيجِ No foundation has been made in Islam greater than the foundation of marriage. No foundation has been made in Islam more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the foundation of marriage. Indeed, the one who marriage, marries, the hadith says that he has protected half his religion. The one who marries... <laughs> has protected half his religion. Whereas the hadith on the opposite side says that the people of hellfire, the majority of the people of hellfire, whether male or female doesn't matter, the majority of the people of hellfire will be the unmarried one. That doesn't mean that all unmarried ones will go to hellfire, but that means that the majority of those in hellfire will be unmarried. And the hadith says the one who wishes to meet his Lord in a state of purity, in a state of being purified should do so with a ma- with a partner. This is the importance of marriage. Of course, the earlier one gets married, the better. Not that you should get married as a child, but the hadith of the Prophet also says, "Ma min shabin tazawaja fi hadathat sinhi illa ajja shaytanu wa'ila ya wa'ila asma minni thulthaydin." A normal person who marries has protected half his religion, but a young person, a person who in the prime of his youth, not when he gets 30, but in the prime of his youth when he gets married, then his own shaitan, that shaitan which is behind him, cries out that this person has now protected two-thirds of his religion from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that 
ان هي سيز ذات يو شود ماري اوف انكو الايام منكم يو شود ماري اوف ذا سينجل وانز اوف يو اند دونت وري اباوت ثينجز لايك اوف كورس وي نيد تو بي رياليستيك بو وي شودنت كونسرن اور سيلف تو ماتش ويز poverty and things like that, that they will get poor or so forth. يُغْنِهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide them. Of course, we need, to, uh, we need to assist in this matter. We need to be active in this matter. We need to be on the forefront. We cannot just stand behind and say that, you know, uh, Allah will provide. We need to work for our provision. But marriage has been highly, highly recommended. The best way to fulfill the rights of the private parts is to marry and for the ones who helps in marriage the hadith says that there is a uh, shadow under the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and amongst the few people who will get the shadow who will be able to stand beneath this shade the one who will be able to stand beneath this shade is amongst them is the one who helps a mu'min and a mu'mina to get married So inshallah we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he helps us to control our desires, those of the lust and those of the hunger. And that he gives us tawfiq to fulfill all our rights to the nafs. And inshallah next week we will be starting to talk about the rights of our acts such as prayers and zakat and hajj and so forth. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. والسلام على المرسلين وعلى محمد وعلى الطيبين الطاهرين <تصفيق>